mask 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 true these are all masks in the conventional sense but we we don't subscribe to convention we are game developers and we use masks as a visual effect to limit what is drawn on the screen for example i want this donut to look like it had a bite taken out of it Sure, I can draw two images ahead of time, one full donut and one with a bite. But that is a static image that will always look the same. With masks, I can make it dynamic. I can eat the whole donut in a few chomps. So let's start simple. The most basic mask you can use is a simple rectangle. Anything that is drawn within the rectangle will be visible. Anything outside will not be drawn. Take a look at the article linked in the description. We enable the scissor test, then define the scissor bounds. Whatever we draw here is now cut off at the specified bounds. This is a very limiting technique. What practical use would this serve? This is more useful as a performance enhancement as the fragments that are not visible will not be pushed through the OpenGL pipeline. The next technique builds on this idea. Why limit it to one rectangle when you could have multiple rectangles? A scissor stack only allows drawing in the area where all the rectangles overlap. First, you do the initial setup and define the scissor rectangles. Then you push the scissor stack and draw what you want masked. Then pop the scissors. Notice the overlap here where the drawing is visible. You'll see a lot of practical use of scissor stack in UI development, but I honestly don't feel it's that useful in terms of your visual game. You still end up with one rectangle as the mask. Using the depth buffer technique is much more useful. You are not limited to axis aligned rectangles, and we can actually start building my donut example. We need to initialize a shape renderer. In our draw method, we need to set the depth test settings. Then use the shape renderer to draw the mask. We'll enable the depth func equals test to draw the masked elements. I had to make some modifications to fit my donut example. The example is set to only draw where I specify the mask. I set the depth func to less so that I don't draw where the mask is. I also made another test doing nearly the same thing except with the shape drawer lib. Shape drawer is a superior alternative to shape renderer, though it doesn't give you much advantage here in this example. Make sure to review my example code linked in the description. There is one major flaw to using the depth buffer in these examples. Look closely at the edges where the image is cut. There is no anti-aliasing. That may be fine for your pixel art game. It doesn't fit my visual style, however. You also must build your mask with shapes. That can become tedious with complex designs. Let's look at masking with the blending function. To better understand this, we have to talk a bit about blend functions. You'll see this method, spritebatch.setBlend function. It defines how we combine images and blend colors on the screen. By default, this is set to source alpha and 1 minus source alpha. You can say the first argument is what we're pulling our source data from, our source colors. In this case, we're taking all the pixels that are opaque or partially opaque from the source image. The second argument is our destination. How are we going to blend or multiply these colors when pushed onto the screen? 1 minus source alpha means that more of the destination color will be visible where there is more transparency in the source image. This is what we're used to. Let's change the first argument to one. This means we're taking 100% of the color from the source image, even the parts we normally don't see because they're transparent. See, Photoshop just set the alpha of these pixels to zero, but left the color data in the file. That's why we can still see the background we supposedly deleted. Then let's change the destination argument to zero. Now it doesn't care what was originally there on the screen. It's completely replacing it with what came from the source image. Why the hell would we want that anyway? Let's play with color masks. 
With this color mask, we're only drawing the blue channel, the blue part of the image onto the destination, the screen. Now the green part only. And now alpha only. What? We can't see anything? Yes, we're only drawing the invisible part of the image onto the screen. Does that make sense? We're setting how transparent these parts of the screen are. Basically, a mask. Now we're going to set the color mask back to normal and the blend function to only pull colors from the source image where we've drawn our mask and draw it only where the mask is applied. This is close to what we want, but notice that it screws up where there is supposed to be transparency in the original image. That's why we have to add these couple of lines to subtract the original image's alpha from the mask. Now we have a perfect output. Looking to our improved donut example, you can see the edges are much cleaner now. Anti-aliasing wherever we need it, and we are not limited to primitive shapes. And it's actually pretty performant too. This is a very powerful technique. I had to make a lot of modifications such as inverting the blend mode so we can chew away at the donut. I also had to use a frame buffer because the default buffer on HTML5 doesn't let you draw with zero alpha. Next, we're going to take a slightly different approach by using a pix map. Initialize the pix map and texture here. Create your mask. Then draw the pixels of your original image based on the mask you've drawn by disabling blending. That means the original transparency will be overridden. So no, this does not improve on the technique with Sprite Batch. We found that modifying a pix map like this on HTML5 is incredibly slow. Like, so slow you'll wonder if your game is crashed. Don't use this technique during real-time gameplay. Maybe don't use it at all depending on your game. But why consider pix maps? They're easy to evaluate pixel by pixel. They can be saved effortlessly with the pixmap.io class. You could already be using pix maps for other reasons, so you might as well use them here too. You don't have to restrict yourself to one technique. It's just another tool in your toolbox. Use the best tool for the job. Which brings us to the shader example. We start by setting up the shader, your basic vertex shader, then a fragment shader that allows you to supply a mask. The alpha from the mask directly changes the alpha of the original texture. Make sure to save both of these as text files in your assets folder. This implements a pix map as well, but you can also supply your own texture. Make sure to bind the mask to texture one because that's how the shader program distinguishes between the original texture and the mask. We use this technique in the donut shader example, but as you can see, it seems kind of pointless. Why all this trouble? You can pull textures from lots of sources. For example, you can pull textures from a video using the GDX video lib. This is pretty wild. But the technique is rather simple. See, I made a black and white video of a flame. I want black to be transparent and the white to be fully opaque. So the fragment shader no longer needs to look at the alpha channel. There is no transparency in the video after all. Instead, we should be looking at how white each fragment is. The technical solution is to take an average of red, green, and blue. But in a grayscale source, red, green, and blue are always the same. We'll just sample the red. Make the shader simple, more efficient. With the next technique, we'll be revisiting the sprite batch and shape renderer. This time, however, we'll be removing pixels instead of building the mask. This is easy to achieve by using the blend funk separate method. This is very similar to the blend funk method, but it separates how we handle colors from how we handle transparency. By passing zero for the first two arguments, we're basically saying we don't care about changing the color when we draw. Only change the alpha. In the donut example, we decided to use textures instead of the shape renderer. After much finagling and modification, this is indeed possible to do. Our final example demonstrates how we can use masks to tint an image. The setup is similar. This time we're using a bitmap font and shape renderer. We draw the font, then we draw a rectangle with a gradient over it. 
The coloring only affects the pixels of the font and not the background. This is better illustrated in the donut example where we can make the donut look spotted like a cow. How fun! Although this was a rather long video, it is not completely exhaustive. There can be any number of ways you choose to mask elements in your game. You'll have to weigh your choices by function and performance. My personal favorite is using the sprite batch with the blend function. It gives you the most options and looks pretty good while not hurting your frame rate too much. Always be willing to experiment and profile your game to see what works best. Anyway, keep the skies clear and check your corners, GDXers! No one cared who I was till I put on the mask. If I pull that off, will you die? It would be extremely painful. You're a big guy. For you. Okay, let's see about that. I have to give a huge shout out to my video partner, Groxar. Without him, we wouldn't have the wiki article on masking to begin with. Groxar wanted to promote this F, so here it is! And a very special thanks to these wonderful people on their contributions to masking. Developer Do.